Okay. Uh, hello, graduates. Hello, coaches. Hello, Coach Demi community. Um, thank you for being here to celebrate our new uh, class of certified habit coaches. Um, I'm Coach Tony Stubblebine, I'm the founder of Coach Demi. I'm thrilled to be the MC here for our fourth cohort of graduates. Um, honestly, Kendra and I and the whole Coach Demi uh, me community are so um, proud and inspired by you and so more than that optimistic about the impact that you'll be able to have on your clients lives having habit coaching in your coaching toolbox uh, for some of you maybe you've never coached before and so habit coaching plays for some coaches this role of being the onboarding into the world of coaching which is such a um, amazing and honorable profession of serving others and helping other people achieve their goals. Um, so if that's you, welcome to the world of coaching. For some of you, uh, maybe you're experienced coaches with the experienced practice. And in that case, habit coaching is in your toolbox as a way to provide accountability um, and more concrete action in between your sessions. It kind of fills a gap that have been hard to reach in traditional coaching. And then the other thing that I think we're very aware of and which hopefully you'll become more aware of is the way that habit coaching lets you reach clients that you maybe uh, couldn't reach before, clients who weren't ready to commit term coaching relationship but ha but for whom a smaller, more concrete goal, like, you know, I want to eat a certain way or I want to do a certain productivity routine, like just to hear coaching framed in terms of here is the habit that you are going to achieve, that can be a really uh, nice uh, on-ramp into the world of coaching for clients. So I think that's something to expect as well is that you'll be able to reach clients that otherwise um, didn't didn't think that they were a candidate to have a coach. Um, so uh, the way that our uh, graduation worked, I hope you hope you enjoyed uh, pomp and circumstance. That's the the op the, the traditional opening uh, graduation song, um, and then we're going to have our special. Uh, guest uh, keynote, which I'll introduce and bring to the stage in a second, and then Kendra will come on board and uh, honor each of today's uh, graduates. And uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Nir Ayal, who is the um, author of uh, two very important books, Hooked and Indistractable, and a former Stanford lecturer, and someone who I respect very much and I'm honored to have uh, be our keynote speaker. Nir, could I have you come to the stage? Hey, everyone. It's great to be here with you today. I am calling in from Singapore, which is why it's dark out here. But it is a real honor and pleasure to be with you today as you embark uh, on your journey to coaches. So first of all, let me say to you a warm congratulations, graduates, to all of you as Habit Coaches. It's a tremendous achievement, and I'm so very proud to be involved with this organization, and Kendra and Tony's work is just phenomenal, so super glad to be here. I wanted to say just a few words as you embark uh, upon your, your next step as Habit Coaches that I wanted to uh, elaborate on something that's not oftentimes discussed, which is how habits are sometimes the wrong tool for the job. And I don't wanna pour cold water on anyone's uh, expectations at the moment, but I, I think this is something that's at, at, at this moment a little bit um, not explored enough. I, I think it's something that's kind of glossed over that I want you to know that sometimes habits are not the right tool for every behavior. And what do I mean by that? You see, some of your clients that you'll begin to work with will use this idea of habits as code to mean I want to do something that I don't really want to put effort into doing, right? That we hear people saying, oh, I want to make exercise into a habit. I want to make 
writing a novel into a habit? Well, unfortunately, many of these types of behaviors don't actually meet the definition of what is a habit. Of course, there's many behaviors that do fit the definition, but let's make sure we're all on the same page. I'm sure you've heard this before. The definition of a habit is a behavior done with little or no conscious thought. Those are habits. But what happens if the behavior requires a lot of conscious thought? You know, I've been a professional author for well over a decade. I've written two bestsellers, countless articles. Writing has never been a habit for me because it's something done with tons of thought. It's tons of conscious effort. When I'm writing, it's not easy at all. It is a slog. It is very, very difficult. And in fact, in many ways, it's the antithesis of a habit. Did you ever ask yourself, what is the opposite of a habit? The opposite of a habit is deliberate practice. I'm sure you've read all about deliberate practice. You've seen you know, some amalgamation of the 10,000 hour rule. Well, deliberate practice requires us to think to, very consciously about what we're doing so we can get better. So behaviors that require this type of conscious effort that require deliberate practice, this constant improvement, require a ton of conscious thought. Now, why is this so important? Why isn't this just semantics? Who really cares here? Well, the reason this is so important is that sometimes your clients, if they find that, hey, I've been doing this behavior that you told me I could turn into a habit, and I've been doing it for 20 days, 30 days, 45 days, 60 days, it's still hard, right? It's not easy. It hasn't become a habit. Why not? And what many people will do is that they will blame themselves. They'll think that there's something wrong with them, that somehow they are deficient. And that's, of course, something that can lead to failure. It's something that leads to people quitting. It's something lead, that leads them to potentially firing their habit coach, which is why I wrote War This Shirt today, that good things take time, that not every behavior necessarily needs to be a habit. Many behaviors can be routines. What is a routine? A routine is simply a series of behaviors frequently repeated. So understanding the key difference between what's a habit and what's a routine is very important for, your, for you and your client uh, to understand so that we have the proper expectations around what type of behaviors require de uh, deliberate practice, require effort, require sometimes struggle, and what kind of behaviors are good candidates to be habits. Now, for those behaviors that we, behaviors that we can turn into habits, wonderful. Let's do that. But what about those routines? Let's talk about for a moment, what is the enemy of these routines? Why don't people do the things that they know they should do? What's the barrier? And in my uh, research, what I've uncovered is that the barrier is not a lack of understanding. You know, we live in an age where you can find out how to do something very, very easily, right? We, we all basically know what to do if it's dieting, right? We all know that to be healthier, we have to eat right and exercise. <laughs> Everybody knows that. You don't need to buy a diet book to tell you that. Who doesn't know that a piece of chocolate cake is not as healthy as a healthful salad, right? Who doesn't know that if we want to uh, build closer relationships with our family members and friends, we have to be fully present with them. We can't be on our devices. We have to be there with them to have better relationships, and we have to put in the time. We know that. Who doesn't know that if we want to excel at our work, that we have to do the hard work that other people don't want to do, right? We know this already. We just have to do the work. So the question is, why don't we do these behaviors? What's, what, what's preventing us from doing these behaviors, be they forming these habits in the first place or continuing these routines? Well, I think the culprit here is not that we don't know what to do. We all know basically what to do. And if we don't know what to do, we can Google it and easily find out. The culprit here is that we don't know how to stop getting in our own way. We don't know how to stop getting distracted, which is why I believe the skill of the century is becoming indistractable. There is no area of your life that doesn't depend on your ability to follow through, to live with personal integrity. And I think this is, whether you know it or not, this is really what you're giving your clients. You're not giving your clients just the ability to form new habits, new behaviors, to change their lives. What you're really doing them for them is giving them a sense of personal integrity. You are allowing them to be as honest with themselves as they are with other people. You know, most people are pretty honest with others, right? They want to tell the truth to their family, their friends, their coworkers. Most people value honesty, but most people lie to themselves every day. They say they're going to work out. They don't. They say they're going to be with their family. They're, they're not. They say they're going to work on that big assignment, the big project, but they procrastinate. 
So what you're giving your clients is personal integrity. And once they feel that, that is a remarkable, remarkable self-image that they now adopt. And it's, a, it's an amazing way to live. It feels incredible. And the way we do that is by helping them do whatever it is they say they are going to do. So what I want to do is to take a, 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 just a couple minutes and explain this model I've been working on for the past five years that's the basis of my book, Indistractable, and how we can all live with personal integrity and do what we say we're going to do. So the first place to understand what is distraction and how can we become indistractable is to understand what is the opposite of distraction. If you ask most people what is the opposite of distraction, they'll tell you it's focus, right? The opposite of distraction is focus, but that's not true. The opposite of distraction is not focus. The opposite of distraction, in fact, is traction. That both words come from the same Latin root, trahare, which means to pull. And you'll notice that both words end in the same six letters, A-C-T-I-O-N, that spells action. So traction, by definition, is any action that pulls you towards what you said you were going to do, things that you do with intent, things that help move you towards your values and help you become the kind of person you want to become. Now, the opposite of traction is distraction. Distraction is any action that pulls you farther away from what you plan to do, something that is not in accordance with your values, that pulls you farther away from becoming the kind of person you want to become. Those are acts of distraction. So why is this so important? This is important for two main reasons. Number one, anything can become a distraction, right? How many times, if you're anything like I used to be, do you sit at your desk and you say, okay, now I'm going to work on that big project. I'm not going to let anything get in my way. I'm not going to get distracted. Here I go. I'm going to not, you know, I'm not going to procrastinate. I'm going to get started on that big project I've been putting off. But first I want to check some email, right? First I want to cross off some to-dos on my to-do list. Let me do that stuff real quick just to get that out of the way. And what we don't realize is that that is the most dangerous form of distraction that we know because this is an example of how distraction can trick us into prioritizing the easy and the urgent at the expense of the important work that we know we have to do. So anything that is not what you plan to do is by definition a distraction. And conversely, anything you plan to do that you do with intent is traction. So, you know, in the news media today, we hear a lot about how technology is addicting us and it's melting our brains and it's hijacking our minds. Rubbish. There's nothing morally superior or inferior to playing a video game versus watching a football game on TV. Any way you plan to spend your time, as long as it's in accordance with your values and according to your schedule, is fine. The time we plan to waste is not wasted time. So as long as you plan that time, that's an act of traction. So if you can picture in your mind, we have traction, we have distraction. Now we have to ask ourselves, what prompts us to take these, these actions? Well, here we have two kinds of triggers. We have external triggers and internal triggers that lead us towards traction and distraction. External triggers are the usual suspects, the things all around us, the pings, the dings, the rings, anything in our outside environment that can lead us to either traction or distraction. But it turns out, get this, only 10% of the time that you get distracted, 10% of the time you check your phone, are you checking your device because of an external trigger? Only 10% of the time. Well, what's the other 90%? The other 90% of the time that we get distracted, that we check our devices, is not because of an external trigger, but rather because of what we call an internal trigger. What is an internal trigger? An internal trigger is an uncomfortable emotional state that we seek to escape from. Boredom, loneliness, fatigue, uncertainty, anxiety, stress, these uncomfortable emotional states that we want to escape, and most often we escape them with distraction. And the fact of the matter is that I don't care if it's too much news, too much booze, too much football, too much Facebook, every distraction, it's not a character flaw, there's nothing wrong with you, your brain isn't broken, it's simply that we haven't learned how to deal with discomfort in a helpful way that leads us towards traction rather than trying to escape it with distraction. So now we have the four points of our compass. This is the model that you can take to your clients, that you can use yourself to help you and them do what you say you're going to do. No matter what that thing that you want to do is, spend quality time with your family, work on that big project, 
work on that business and stay and, and, and not get distracted while you do it. Uh, work on your health, your physical, me mental wellness. All of this requires your ability to control your attention. This is ultimately how we choose our life. And we do it by, the, by applying these four basic strategies. Number one, master the internal triggers. And there's all kinds of techniques we can use to, to learn to master these internal triggers so they don't become our master. Then we have to make time for traction. The fact of the matter is most people do not plan their day. And that's a huge mistake. Most people use this terrible technique of running their life off of a to-do list. And it turns out that running your day off a to-do list rather than a calendar is one of the worst things you can do for your personal productivity. And there's a lot of research that shows this that I explain in my book, Indistractable. So if you don't plan your day, somebody is going to plan it for you. And if you don't know what is traction, you don't know what is distraction. You can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. So we have to help folks make time for traction in their day to live out their values. The next step, step number three, is to hack back the external triggers. There is so much that we can do right now that proves that we are so much more powerful than all of these distractions. For example, what's Mark Zuckerberg going to do if we turn off notifications, right? How many of us complain about getting constantly distracted, but we sleep next to our cell phones every night, right? There's some very simple things we can do that everyone can do to hack back those external triggers using technology, ironically enough, to prevent getting distracted by technology. All kinds of techniques we can use there. Finally, the fourth step is to prevent distraction with PACs. PACs apply what we call a pre-commitment device. It's our last line of defense. It's the firewall to prevent us from getting distracted if those other three strategies fail. So these are the four key pillars of becoming indistractable, master the internal triggers, make time for traction, hack back the external triggers, and prevent distraction with PACs. This is what I've been working on for the past five years, researching. There's over 30 pages of, of citations to peer-reviewed studies. This is just some techniques I made up. Tons of great research I hope you'll check out. The book, again, is called Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. I hope you'll check it out. And I truly do believe that we can get the best out of these technologies and tools without letting them get the best of us. We can all become indistractable. And with that, congratulations, graduates. Stay strong, stay indistractable, and keep up the wonderful work. Nir, thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was an amazing talk. We're so blessed to have you today. Um, uh, I'm curious, I hope some of the coaches stick around for the networking at the end, because I'm curious how they uh, took what you said and kind of combined it with the models that, that we give. But one thing stood out to me right away, which is we feel like there's this incredible power in tackling a, a goal with a habit because it puts a client in a position of dealing with reality. So they like the tendency is to do all of this upfront planning. And, and we're like, well, mostly you're planning for the wrong things. And an internal trigger is exactly that thing that they're not going to plan for because they haven't really acknowledged yet or are that aware of what's going on. So like the way that we coach is we get them a keystone habit, we get them moving right away. And then, and then we ask yeah. what went wrong and why. And so then finally we're starting yeah. to deal with yeah. what are the real issues that get um, in the way of a goal. So anyways, that was very deep. And Nir, I appreciate you so much for coming to talk to oh, all my of our pleasure. coaches today. Okay, I'll let you off the stage. I'm honored to be here. Take all care, right. everyone. Take Good care. luck. Um, and now it's my uh, honor to uh, to introduce and welcome your teacher, your coach, Coach Kendra, the the most successful habit coach of all time, and uh, one of my favorite collaborators and someone who I have a tremendous amount of respect for. Kendra, I'll give it I'll give it to you uh, to carry us through. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Uh, I don't I don't know about the, the the greatest of of all time, but maybe the 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 most uh, most experienced. And I know so many of these folks um, are going to have in, incredible careers. So so thank you, Tony. Thanks so much, Near. You know, I as soon as I heard he was going to be our uh, our our speaker, um, I just I, I I couldn't wait. And I and I've never heard him speak. Um, these are a huge privilege for me as well to get to hear from the people 
um, that I've studied for years. So it's a it's a treat. I'm having a little bit of a of a fan moment, um, and I love love so many of you are working on what I would call internal triggers. I think your your practices align so so well with exactly what he was talking about. So I hope I hope you see that this program is just the start of your habit coaching journey and your own studies um, of habits and the way that we can help lead ourselves and help lead others. So I hope this is just a kickoff, um, that this series has been a beginning for you. Um, and today represents a milestone in the journey and not, uh, not an end. So I hope you'll keep learning. All right, so now I am delighted to introduce our fourth cohort of the Habit Coach Certification Program. These coaches have studied and practiced and can guide their clients through harnessing momentum to make positive changes. I am particularly thankful, thankful for how resilient this group is. During our program, many of us faced extreme weather and other challenges, and yet here we are. Let's recognize these outstanding graduates. Nicole Akers puts riders on the path to quickly making money on medium.com with the keystone habit of focused riding for 30 minutes a day. Pete Arnstein partners with high performing finance prof controller mindset to C-suite leader mindset so they can aim higher and unleash their leadership potential with the keystone habit of choosing to listen and pause before speaking. Jackie Cahill, results driven, overwhelmed individuals implement nourishing and empowering wellness routines with the keystone habit of one minute of daily core strength exercise. Taroni Donaldson, helps people who want to read more books establish a smart habit with the keystone habit of reading one page a day. Ash Frazier helps people build with a series of simple practices, beginning with the keystone habit of their mirror. Tejal Kaji helps people confidently step into their lives, both at work and at home, to pursue, to pursue meaningful goals that bring them joy, with the key daily journaling to ignite their inner leader. Rabia Karmali helps overwhelmed individuals work through their catastrophic thoughts so that they increase their confidence and achieve their goals with the keystone habit of reframing negative thoughts through journaling. Paul Cagle helps future leaders build mental strength so that they can take control and feel empowered of choosing to take ownership. Diane helps solopreneurs who feel stuck and overwhelmed to get unstuck by starting small habits to reach big goals in their business with the keystone habit of planning for tomorrow to get shit done. Katie Maureen helps social anxiety sufferers overcome their fear of communicating of identifying their negative automatic thoughts to have the social life they want. Kendra Morning helps people dramatically improve their diet and eating habits without deprivation or reliance on willpower with the keystone habit of selecting techniques to crush their cravings. Shade Odende helps single Christians who are struggling with celibacy overcome the guilt of living in alignment with their values so they can have peace of mind and truly thrive in their Christian walk habit of daily celibate reflection. Ariwula Agbemi helps overwhelmed professionals achieve their goals 
with the keystone habit of getting their most done daily. Alexandros Papanum helps high strung people who identify as givers avoid burnout and be productive so they can enjoy the things and people they love with the keystone being a practice of focus. Gunner Quant supports young graduates and students taking a shortcut towards fulfilling work with the keystone habit of push-ups. Tracy Ramsey helps motivated real estate agents create and maintain a steady flow of income with the keystone habit of systematically expanding their sphere of influence. Gert Rasmussen helps people develop a healthier life with the keystone habit of starting the day with a healthy meal. Lauren Rayburn, minds and compassionate hearts reduce stress and overwhelm by building a healthier relationship with their to-do with the keystone habit of setting daily intentions. Maria Salman helps emotional eaters cultivate mindfulness practices so they can live more freely with the keystone habit of embracing gratitude to overcome emotional eating. Mike Vasco helps sales professionals save and invest more with the keystone habit of tracking daily spending in less than five minutes a day. Ramon Williamson helps busy people make consistent progress without losing focus with the keystone habit of setting for Congratulations again to our 21 newest certified habit coaches. Thank you all so much for joining us today. It has absolutely pleasure um, to lead this program and to celebrate the hard work of these outstanding coaches today. Graduates, head over the, to the networking section. I might play the music. Um, um, but I want to see you over in networking. Thank you.